So good afternoon. And first of all, please excuse my mistakes in English, as I could not find anyone to correct my text before today. I'm very happy to be here again at St. Vladimir's Seminary. For today, I propose to Father Chad Hadfield to speak, uh, to speak again of my favorite topic and research, that is the dialogue between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox churches, a topic which I discussed already here in my last speech at St. Vladimir's in 2017, when I presented my book on this, on this dialogue, which was published at Volos in 2016 and which is uh, available in the library. Unfortunately, I cannot say any new things as nothing new has happened since then and even before. In fact, since 1993, when Metropolitan Damascinus, who died in 2011 and who was my bishop in Geneva, my hometown, was one of the two presidents of the dialogue, together with Metropolitan Bishop of the Coptic Orthodox Church. We can say that Metropolitan Damascinus has been a great pioneer and hard worker for the dev development of this dialogue. With him, the dialogue took a quick start and was very fruitful and promising. Some people, such as Pope Shemida of the Coptic Orthodox Church, were full of hope and were even thinking that unity was possible uh, to be achieved and was even at close. And 30 years later, we are very far from this, unfortunately. One can sense that the impulse towards ruin of the churches has slowed. And as Father Erickson says, the reason for the division of our churches seems to be division itself. We may find reasons and excuses for it, but are they good excuses? Some are and others are not. For example, at the practical level of the organization of the dialogue, Metropolitan Damascinos had a stroke and was then unable to continue his work physically and intellectually. Half of his body was somehow paralyzed. As he was alive, he could not be replaced. His successor was Emmanuel Adamakis, then responsible of the Greek Orthodox Bishopric of France, and now Metropolitan of Chalcedon. He organized two meetings, in 2005 at Chambézy in Geneva and in 2014 in Athens. Then, at the political level, we all know that the Christians in the Middle East, especially in Egypt, Iraq, and Syria, had to face terrible persecutions in the year 2000s and onward. And it is clear that in such conditions, the organization of ecumenical dialogues was not their priority. Their priority was survival. Uh, on that topic, I would just mention my book on discrimination and persecutions of, of the Copts um, from 1970 until the fall of Mubarak which unfortunately is available only in French, and maybe I should organize an English translation because this is one page of the history of the Coptic Orthodox Church. What is more disturbing is the following fact. How to organize encounters and dialogues on church unity between two families of churches, in our case, the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox, when there is this unity between two churches, patriarchates of the same family. For example, as you know, between the patriarchates of Constantinople and Moscow. And this was also the case until recently between the two patriarchates of Antioch and Jerusalem. On the side of the Oriental Orthodox, one can also notice some disagreements. For example, the fact that the Malankara Syrian Orthodox Church in India has problems with the mother church, the Syrian Orthodox Church of Antioch, we've seen it in Damascus in Syria. In Ethiopia, there are fights between the official 
Orth East, uh, Ethiopian Orthodox uh, Patriarchate, we sit in Addis Abeba, the capital, with local groups who claim to found new patriarchates in Tigray and in the Oromo region. In that zone, there is also no real peace with the neighboring Eritrean Orthodox Church. Obviously, also for political reasons, as Putin helps President Assad, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch, we sit in Damascus, is pro-Russia and pro-Moscow Patriarchate. In Egypt, the position of the Coptic Orthodox Church seems to lean to Moscow, as showed, for example, by the fact that this church has provided a church building to be used in Gaza, in Giza, sorry, that is in Cairo, for a Russian church. At the political level, the Egyptian government has given land in Cairo for a Russian cathedral to be built, while the autocephalous, autochthonous Copts have difficulties to have permits to build or even repair a church. When I visited Egypt and Ethiopia in 2022, I noticed that the Orthodox Copts and Ethiopians were pro-Russia and pro-Putin and pro-Moscow Patriarchate. Some explained to me that it was because they were against the USA at the political level and in general against the decadent USA and Europe. So, um, I should mention here quickly the bilateral dialogue between also the Moscow Patriarchate and the Oriental Orthodox churches. So they have created a commission of dialogue with a first meeting in 2001. And um, at, in, uh, then the Moscow Patriarchate created a commission of bilateral dialogue with the Armenian Church of Echmiadzin in 2001, with the Coptic Church in 2014, with the Ethiopian Church in 2018, with the Syrian Orthodox Church in 2015, with the Malankara Church of India in 2019. And all this, in all this, we should not forget the old political contacts of Syria, Egypt, and Ethiopia with the ex-Soviet Union. All this creates also problems in the diaspora context of the Oriental Christians having similar ideas. And according to me, all this is also connected with nationalism, which is the worst sickness of orthodoxy today. This is my comment. And this is the main question which orthodox must answer today. What does the church unity really mean? Fortunately, there are some places of positive and fruitful dialogue, for example, in some seminaries and theological schools, and of course, St. Vladimir is one of them, together with Holy Cross in Boston. And uh, well, of course, you, you know about these places where you have students from the Oriental Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox studying in the same place. That is the case with Michael Halgen in Sweden or with uh, the Institute of Father Michael Bakker in Nimegen University. Now I would like to share some thoughts inspired by me by my recent reading of the article by Father John Erickson entitled, From Division to Dialogue and Beyond, The Quest for Eastern and Oriental Orthodox Unity. As Father Erickson says, following Mayendorf and other scholars, Chalcedon itself left a number of issues unresolved, both in Christology and in Soteriology. For the sake of our dialogue today, we must understand that the Fifth Ecumenical Council by Eastern Orthodox in Constantinople in 553, not recognized by the non-Chalcedonians, once again emphasized, I mean, this um, Council of 553 once emphasized the authority and thus 
the importance of Saint Cyril of Alexandria and fully incorporated into its definition the Theopashid formulations, which those rejecting Chalcedon had long regarded as essential for orthodoxy. After 553, it was clear that Chalcedon could be interpreted only in the light of the Christology of Saint Cyril of Alexandria, and beyond that, his soter soteriology. What is important to understand is that Chalcedon, the fourth of the councils, regarded as ecumenical only in the Eastern Orthodox churches, does not stand alone. It must be read in the light of the fifth and subsequent councils. Now on faith, all Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox people who are positive for this dialogue or not, all agree that in no case may purity of faith be compromised. Of course, for all of us, faith is the main thing. The proper basis for unity is true faith or orthodoxy, which can be expressed in different Christological formulas as the official dialogue explains in the communique. The question is, <clears throat> what do we understand as orthodoxy? In fact, it is not only a question of faith. Orthodoxy involves not only right belief, belief but also right worship. After Chalcedon, we notice several differences in worship and liturgical practices, such as the Armenian use of azims, that is, un unleavened bread, and a chalice, chalice and mixed with water in the Eucharist. But now, according to Father Erickson, I quote him, we may indeed have reached a point where liturgical differences will no longer be taken automatically as signs of Christological disagreement, end of quote. Now on anathemas. Today, one can say that Objections coming from both sides have focused more specifically on the anathemas which the churches hurled against each other during their many centuries of, divisions, of division. Theologian scholars such as Professor Fidas of Athens and Professor Erickson have answered the question of anathemas, and you can read their articles in my book published at Volos in 2016. Now, practically inseparable from the question of anathemas is the question of the meaning and authority of ecumenical councils. This is one of the main questions, if not the main question, debated today by people who criticize the contemporary theological dialogue between the two families of churches, including Jean-Claude Larchet in his book, Personne et Nature, published in Paris by Le Serre in 2011. According to the Joint Commission for Dialogue, a sufficient basis for reconciliation is the fact that both families of churches confess the faith of all seven of the councils recognized as ecumenical by the Chalcedonians, even though they do not accord the same ecumenical authority to all these councils. But is this sufficient? In fact, according to some Eastern Orthodox, the Orientals must indicate their full acceptance of seven ecumenical councils. They must accept not only the substance of the faith of these councils, but also their disciplinary norms and terminology, and also their anathemas. In 1993, the Joint Commission for theological dialogue between the churches issued proposals for the lifting of anathemas whereby full communion could be restored. And this, of course, should be uh, accepted by all the heads of all the churches on of both sides. Father Erickson asks also this question. If, in fact, both families of churches confess the same faith of all seven of the councils, 
recognized as ecumenical by the Chalcedonians, and if they recognize that councils four through seven did not add anything to this faith, but only responded to perceived distortions and errors, would this not be a sufficient basis for reconciliation? End of quotation. Well, I think we can discuss this and you can give your comments on this after my talk. Now on some critical and neg negative trends on the dialogue. Some opposition to the work of the Joint Commission took place in some churches or groups by publishing some remarks in different ways. Some critics were expressed in a rather soft way, for example, by the Synod of the Moscow Patriarchate in 1994. And saying that, I quote, to judge that the second agreed statement, uh, that is in 1990, cannot be considered as a definite text and that it is necessary to continue the work and to prepare a more detailed study. The dialogue was also attacked, but in a fiery way by the community of Mount Athos. For example, in a memorandum in 1995, referring to the Christological formulations of the texts elaborated at the dialogue. And this text widely circulated, even on the internet. Mount Athos is a place known to be a fighter for orthodoxy and orthodox faith, and not to be ecumenical. Now, on this last point, Father Placide Dessay, a French Catholic Cistercian monk who became a monk of Mount Athos and founded a monastery in France, explained to me uh, some years ago that in fact there are several trends on Mount Athos and we cannot speak of one Mount Athos. And one trend is that of monks who received proper theological education and understanding on our dialogue, such as in the monastery of Simonos Petra. And I know that some Copts and non-Chalcedonians you know, went and visited that place and they were not called monophysites, you know. And from Oriental, other Oriental Orthodox who visit, visited Mount Athos in the last years, I heard that they were well received in several monasteries and by a number of, of monks. And uh, myself, I, I happened to meet some monks of Mount Athos who were open-minded, you know, for this dialogue and who would not call the non-Chalcedonian Monophysite. So this shows that we have to give up our prejudice and not to repeat blindly what we hear and read. And it's important to analyze people's speeches and writings and not to have or to give and transmit restricted views. And for me, this is also part of the dialogue. Now, other questions may still be asked, for example, on fasts. As times of fastings, which are quite strict and strictly followed in both Eastern and Oriental Orthodox churches might be different. I just give the example of the fast of Heraclius or Nineveh, which is followed by the Coptic and Syrian Orthodox and Armenian uh, churches. On the veneration of the Virgin and Saints, we can say that it is similar in both families of churches. There are many great saints who are common to both families, that is, before Chalcedon. But how to handle the question of the saints recognized by each family after Chalcedon? The dialogue proves the recognition of local saints who have, no, who have not had problems with dogmas. And then about the two famous cases of Saint Severus of Antioch and Saint Dioscoros of Alexandria, we know very well that uh, Severus was just a follower of Cyril of Alexandria and was following his Miaphysite terminology. And so did Dioscoros, who, by the way, was not anatomized because of dogmatic reasons, but for canonical reasons, as you know. 
Then, as for the spirituality and monastic life, they are at large very similar in the two families of churches. On that topic, you can see my books on light and spirituality of the Oriental Orthodox churches, which are here in your library and now also, uh, also accessible for free as scanned books on internet and your librarian can give you all the details. In short, for the sake of our dialogue, we must understand how we are and can be enriched by one another's tradition at the spiritual, monastic, and theological levels, also by reading the texts of the other churches, tradition, uh, traditions in all these fields. So I think that we all must make the effort of reading these texts and to, to see by ourselves what these people believe and uh, pray, etc. Now let us pass to the point which is for me essential in the dialogue and for which I spent about 40 years of my life. That is practical dialogue and I understand from Father Chad that this is also very important for him and for Saint Vladimir. For the sake of practical dialogue, in the 1990s I founded an association in Paris where I was living at that time and then we used to make visits of parishes with encounters with the priests and faithful, concerts of liturgical music were organized, etc. During the dialogue, the theologians of the two families of churches did discuss and write down recommendations in order to inform properly on the dialogue. And first of all, they recommended that the clergy of the two families of churches and especially the students in seminaries who will be the future clergy would speak together and, and share. Our faithful of the two families of churches must experience the dialogue as a living reality in practical dialogue and they must not consider the dialogue as being simply a matter for theologians and specialists. And I'm convinced that each one of you can do something for the sake of the dialogue. As I repeat, it is not only the work of specialists and theologians. Now I would like to add a word on the role of psychology in the dialogue. I have met some people who blindly repeat that the non-Calcedonians are monophysite because they have not been informed properly. They do not want to listen to the others and keep blindly their reality without any question. In such cases, it seems to me that there is a blockage, also maybe, I would say, at the psychological level. Such people should make the effort at least to read some patristic and liturgical texts of the non-Calcedonians, as now many uh, of these texts have been translated into Western languages and are available for a large public. Now, I just want to, to mention the fact at the liturgical level that uh, if you hear the treparia, which are used uh, until now in the Coptic Orthodox Church, they are sung in Greek until today, and they are exactly the same as the ones used in the Eastern Orthodox churches. So I have not found a liturgist who has studied this matter, but I think it's a very interesting topic because, well, uh, um, where, you know, so does it mean that these, uh, when were these troparia uh, composed? Was it before Chalcedon, after Chalcedon? How did they pass from the Chalcedonian to the non-Chalcedonians? There is a whole, history, you know, to discover, and which is very interesting. Then I have a little anecdote, because in 1985, I visited about 12 um, women's monasteries in, in Greece, together with two Coptic nuns coming from Egypt. And we also visited the great monastery of Ormilia. And uh, so I had just discovered that, you know, they, they had this uh, similar troparia, not only the troparia, but also the monogenes. 
And so these Coptic nuns were singing some troparia and the monogenes in front of um, the Gerondisa. And when she heard this, she said, what do you, you, you pray, you sing the monogenes, but you are orthodox, you know? And in one second, she had a different understanding of the faith of these Coptic nuns. So this is why, you know, it's so important that uh, we, we visit each other, we discuss, we, we listen to our uh, prayers, which include so much uh, dogma, and uh, we, we should do it as much as possible wherever we live. What is really important is the fact that such prayers showing an orthodox theology and Christology, I speak of the prayers of the Oriental Orthodox, have been repeated since the fifth century, that is the time of after Chalcedon, by all the people of the Oriental, uh, well, of the non-Chalcedonians, from the patriarchs, bishops, clergy, faithful, and children, along the centuries and until now. So, you know, they expressed this correct Christology in their prayers from the time of Chalcedon until now. According to me, this is the best way to convince people about a common faith of the two families of churches through their liturgical texts. And when we understand this, how to repudiate, how to repudiate these people and their faith? Um, <clears throat> we understand that on the Chalcedonian side, there is this disagreement even over how the necessary unanimity is to be attained and proclaimed. Must everything depend upon the convocation of a holy and great council? Or can some other mechanism be found? This, this remains to be seen. Anyway, such questions are still very abstract, as it is unlikely that a mutual lifting of anathemas on the part of the Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian churches will take place any time in the foreseeable future, unfortunately. Conclusion. Today, we can see two groups of people, the ones who are open for the dialogue and the others who are not satisfied. Of course, it is proper to have some addition, additions and further studies, like what is requested by the Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church. But should we accept that this would last for decades, for centuries, thus keeping this unity alive for a very long time? If we understand that the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox have so much in common, and in particular have a Christology, which is, I, I mean, have a correct Christology, which was the main point of this unity. Is it proper to reject this possibility of unity after we study properly the questions discussed in this paper? Um, now, as Father Erickson concludes in his article, and I quote, if these church families can overcome their division of centuries, if they can recognize in each other the same one faith, if they can enter into a life of communion in the deepest sense of that word, their reunion will be a sign of promise for all Christians, that is for Christian unity as required by Christ himself. End of quote. And as Metropolitan Damaskinos wrote in 1998 in my book, Towards Unity, if we understand that faith is common in the two families of churches, it is inadmissible to keep this, 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 this union. And I quote his own words. The ministry of the unity of the church is a witness to faith as it is constantly confessed in the creed. Any quarrelsome theological disposition or diminished sensitivity at the prospect of restoration of ecclesial unity 
when there is an official declaration of full agreement on the right faith should be regarded as unthinkable and certainly as reflecting a false understanding of the operation of the mystery of the church in the history of salvation. End of quote. Is it not great time to study and understand seriously the faith and Christology of the Oriental Orthodox and vice versa here and now? The best theologians of the time, that was in the second part of the uh, 20th century, because the unofficial dialogue began in the 1960s. So these best theologians were appointed by their own patriarchates and churches to elaborate the texts of the dialogue, which do show in communique the common faith, also at the Christological level. Why do we not trust their work? Is it not great time to take position and decisions and to make step forwards towards unity? And in fact, towards unity was the title of my first book dedicated to the di dialogue published in 1998 and which is also available here in your library and also for free on internet. So this is the end of my paper, and Father Chad asked me also to present very quickly my last publication since, 19 to, uh, since 2017. So one book is The Assyrian Church of the East, published by Peter Lang in Oxford in 2021. And this church is a very ancient apostolic church, which is too often forgotten even in res recent articles and books on church history. Her Christology has been restudied by great scholars such as André de Halle and Sebastian Brock. And in 1994, an agreement was signed between the Assyrian Church of the East and the Catholic Church in Rome to recognize that they are not Nestorian in, in their faith and Mariology. So um, I think that such a bilateral dialogue should also be elaborated with the Eastern Orthodox Church in the future, taking into consideration, first of all, the Christological and Mariological faith of this church today. We have to begin with their faith of today, and then we can go back to the past and make analyses of the past Christology. But this is another question away from our today agenda. Another recent book of mine is The Traditional Teaching of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, published in 2023 by Lit Verlag in Germany, in which I explain about this oral teaching of this church, which is unique today in Christianity. And then in 2022, I have published a book with articles entitled A Short History of the Orthodox Church in Australia, published also by Lit Verlag. And just a little... Uh, uh, something new, uh, some uh, which uh, a new book which I'm I'm preparing about positive things for the sake of the dialogue. Uh, now I prepare a book on the positive relations and exchanges between Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians in the Middle East at different levels, and uh, with articles not only on theology but also exchanges and circulation of the manuscripts, uh, exchanges of liturgical texts, the exchanges in monastic circles, uh, exchanges at the spiritual level and even at the artistic level. And here I want to quote Father Erickson once again. I quote him after Chalcedon, Christological positions, whether among those accepting the council of or those re rejecting it were much more varied and fluid than popular presentations su suggested, making it difficult any longer to view one side as purely orthodox and the other as purely heretical. Well, um, as I said, I have given 40 years of my life for this dialogue. And I hope that some of the students who are present here today will also try to do their best
to um, make the dialogue grow in the future. So I have uh, shared with you some thoughts and I, I now, I'm, now I would be very happy to hear your questions and comments on what to do for this dialogue today and in the future. Thank you very much. I hope that you have questions. Yes, please. Can you come to the microphone? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have two, I think, short questions. The first, you mentioned that there is a uh, no, can, uh, there is uh, two parties within the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, more sympathetic and less sympathetic to dialogue. And um, which of these would you say represents a majority opinion, if either one? Well, <laughs> you know, of course, there are churches with a very great number of faithful. So if we count at that level, I'm afraid to say that the majority would not be very interested in the dialogue. This is a sad reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is very sad is that there is no education, you know, because maybe some, I say some of the bishops in each Eastern Orthodox Church has studied about the dialogue, but it's then it, it should be shared at the level, as I said, of, of the seminaries and et cetera, or at the level of the clergy, and if there is no education, then you know the work cannot grow because uh, uh, it has to be shared by by all, and not only by some theologians and maybe some bishops. All right, thank you. And the second question: uh, you mentioned a, a contingent within the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, very anti-union, sort of a knee-jerk response to refer to the non-Chalcedonians as, as uh, monophysites. Is there a, a comparable party in the Oriental Orthodox Church that has this kind of hardline resistance to dialogue with the Eastern Church? Who who would be opposed to the dialogue? Perhaps, yeah. Well, I I I read somewhere, yes, that some Ethiopians in the diaspora, but where it was not mentioned, were maybe not so open. But I never met, you know, because now, as I said, for the forty last years, I have traveled. Uh, very often in the Middle East, in India, in Ethiopia, and I have met many of these parishes in Europe, sometimes in the US, also in Canada and Australia. And I have never met Oriental Orthodox, you know, who, who were against the dialogue. On the contrary, even in villages in Ethiopia, you know, I was always very well received. So I, I, I would say I have never met Oriental Orthodox who were against this dialogue because they they understand, yes, that we have so many things in common. Mm, thank you. So I would say it's more on the side of the Eastern Orthodox that there is a lot of work to be done, right, according to me. Thank you. Thank you. Father? First off, thank you very much for that. That was a joy. Um, we were told uh, recently in a history class that one of the arguments that polemism wasn't an innovation is that the non-Chalcedonians have received it quite well. I wonder if you could speak to non-Chalcedonian assessments of polemism. I said, can you repeat? Because I'm not sure I understood your question. Uh, the po the polemite controversy. The polemite. Yeah, can you speak to non-Chalcedonian assessments of that controversy? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, yes, I heard, like in, in Egypt, you know, they they they... they it's also, I think, a question of vocabulary, because, uh, of course, when you speak of union with God, you know, it can be uh, not very well understood. So you, you, you need all the nuance in your way of explaining things, you know. But already, I mean, in the gospel, they speak of the fact that we are all the sons and daughters of, of, of God, you know. So we can begin with, I think, simple explanations before we read Palamas, who is really or at, a, at a very high level. But I know that uh, uh, there is a Copt in Canada who has made a translation into Arabic of some texts by Palamas. So because, well, he has studied, you know, in... in uh, in Canada with Orthodox people, and so he he's at the level where he can read and understand the writings of Palamas. So I think we always have to be very cautious to understand who, where, when, you know, uh, before, you know, I, I read so many times, 
people saying or writing that Pope Shenouda is a monophysite because he was in his books or booklets written in, in uh, translated into English, you know, they they would put that uh, he believes or the Coptic Church believes in one nature, and immediately people would say, "You see, he is a monophysite because he has written this in his uh, booklets." Well, sorry, it's, then you have to put that in the context which we discussed. You know, you have to understand this is just. A translation. I don't uh, know uh, if it's really the, the, the best translation possible, but this is what you know we translate how we translate it today. And I think in that case, of course, we should keep into brackets, you know, the word miaphysis. And ideally, we should always explain and write that when we speak of miaphysis, the formulation of Saint Cyril we have to underline 10 times that it implies that it is not a simple nature of physics, but a composite nature and including divinity and humanity in Christ, you know. Otherwise, we are going to repeat the same old story forever. So we have to go out of this circle, you know, and then if you don't agree, you know, to, to uh, uh, understand what I just explained, of course, then you will say forever, yes, these people saying one nature, they are all monophysites, you know. So you have to know more than just to, to read a sentence in a book or an article. Is it clear? Did I answer? <laughs> uh, well, I hope that our Indian fathers will have a question. Yes, hello. Thank you for your talk. I have a question about uh, at local level uh, among the two branch families within Orthodox Christianity. In your view, are there things or steps, actions we can take as, for example, at the parishioner or leader priest of the local churches that can advance or enhance the dialogue or yeah, between the two families? Okay. So, um, as you may know, and I have put the texts in my in my book, um, published at Volos, but also in the book, the previous book called uh, Towards Unity, uh, there was there were pastoral, so-called pastoral agreements uh, between the the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch and the Syrian Orthodox Patriarchate, and at that time, uh, well. They, because, you know, in, in the Middle East, you have a special context where you have many, many mixed marriages. So you have Orthodox uh, um, um, who get married with uh, Oriental Orthodox, also with Catholic families, but that's another dialogue. And then they, they were thinking, what can we do, you know, when we have, because then can we have a godfather or godmother from the other church? Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox. So they have established a text, you know, to, to uh, uh, or what to do when an Oriental Orthodox will attend a liturgy or wedding or funerals of the Eastern, in the Eastern Orthodox Church in an Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox parish, you know. These were very practical questions for the context of the, of the Middle East, of course. And, um, so that was a good step, you know, for 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 these pastoral questions. Then in they had an uh, in in Egypt they had also an agreement between the Coptic Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church of Alexandria. Again, because they have the, what to do if you have a mixed marriage, you know, with people of these two churches, and they said something which was really important that, for instance, they would not rebaptize any of them because this is the custom today of the Coptic Church to rebaptize anyone who is not Coptic Orthodox, you know, when they marry, for instance. And so um, this is, of course, very criticized by, by the Catholic Church. But we should not forget that in the 19th century, 
when the Protestant and Catholic missionaries went to Egypt, they rebaptized all the Copts who were already baptized. So, but they forgot that history of the 19th century, and today they are shocked because of the rebaptism. Re this is why also we have to balance uh, things in history, you know, and not to see things only for, for today. So uh, they they agreed between the Coptic Orthodox and Eastern and the Greek Orthodox Church of Alexandria not to rebaptize, and also um, uh, they so that that is also for, uh, important. Yes, to recognize uh, a common wedding, you know. So these were only two points, but the beginning at least for something, but. That was 20 years ago, and nothing new has come out. Because as I said, you know, they had all these political problems in the Middle East and uh, a lot of violence. And of course, their, their main uh, uh, activity was not into ecumenical dialogues. Yes, please, Father. Thank you for your talk. I think after so many decades, spent meeting people and reading texts. Maybe you're a person that I can uh, talk also about, you mentioned the psychological and the political and geopolitical implication or um, aspects of the dialogue. From a Christian point of view, let's call those uh, ethical qualifiers. And uh, my question is about, with we can distinguish between honest theological dialogue, mm -hmm. Regardless of whether it brings fruit of of uh, lifting uh, anathemas in the communion or whether it clarifies the fact that we don't actually belong together, and dishonest theological dialogue, which can be producing texts um, of whatever kind. Why I'm asking this because you mentioned that the Russian Church is um, against. Uh, well, opening, but it's, it's very ambiguous, very ambiguous. Because you mentioned the fact that it's this, all at, these dialogues. At the same time, they have this bilateral uh, dialogue with the Oriental churches since, uh, the, uh, well, uh, in the last uh, 20, 20, more than 20 years. And, you know, so, but they don't speak of theology. And this is for me very tricky, and this is what I call a fake or diplomatic dialogue. In fact, That's I, my question. I, I had it in my text. What, I did not read it. I, I, I say, but that's you know just my poor personal impression that in that case, why to make a bilateral dialogue? First of all, you know, this was this was very political. And I see, I see the impact in Egypt, Ethiopia, and even India today. You know, the Catholicos of the Malankara Church was just coming back from Moscow when I was in, in Kotayam last September. And I was surprised, you know. So they, I don't want to discuss his reasons, but he has reasons. He has reasons for having the friendship of the, of the Russian Patriarchate, which is so powerful, you know. Uh, not only at the religious level, but of course at the political level. And I tried to explain, but it was too too quickly explained, you know, that of course in Egypt, in Ethiopia, they have all these uh, uh, political relationships, you know, with Russia, with the ex-Soviet Union, you know, and all this is, is mixed up, you know, so it's not very clear why do they want this, this uh, bilateral dialogue with the Oriental Orthodox Church if they don't speak of theology, it's, it's I, I repeat for me, it's a fake and diplomatic dialogue because, you know, and they could never say, you know, they even, you know, people like Bishop Ilarion Alfayev, who is really educated and he knows very well that these Oriental churches are not monophysite. But if he was going to say this openly, you know, in public, he he would miss he would lose his position the next morning. So what do you do between the truth and and remaining as a, as a number two in the very powerful Russian Orthodox Church? I'm sorry to speak so openly, but I think it's time to be to be open. We it's it's the situation is too difficult. You know we cannot. Uh, uh, 
uh, play games. We cannot uh, be silent any longer. And today, maybe I speak too openly, and Father Chad will not be happy because I become political, and I have never been political, not only because I'm a Swiss citizen, but uh, because as a Christian and as an Orthodox, I think that we have to speak up and we have to ask painful questions today. And as I said in my text, you know, it is so painful that what is our, the unity of the Eastern Orthodox Church today? You know, it is now into pieces and it's so very painful. And I pray for this unity to come back, you know, because otherwise we are not a church any longer. So, do you, yes, please. So, so, excuse me, Father Chad, to, to speak so openly. I hope you don't. Uh... <laughs> I'm an activist. Well, I, with, my, with age, I become an activist. Yes, I was silent for too many years, but now, you know, I, I, I refuse to be silent. Um, yes, please. Hello. Thank you so much. I'm moved by your thought. You are from? I'm from Coptic. I'm from Africa, Kenya. From which country? Uh, Kenya. I see. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, I'm just going to ask my question based on the small knowledge I had during my Sunday school uh, growing up in church. Yes. Uh, but you were in Kenya? Yes, yes. In Nairobi, in the Coptic church. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, my Sunday school teacher taught me that God is love. And I've grown up knowing that God is love. And one thing I've also, as I grew up, I've realized that uh, God never fails because God is love and love never fails. So I'm wondering at some point, um, why is it that the church is failing to be united? Uh, is it that the church is lacking something? Mm -hmm. Because we know that God is love and God being love, uh, we're supposed to be united and we are supposed to to portray to portray his love. Mm -hmm. So um when you you are saying these things or just this thoughts coming in my mind and um asking myself is it that the church has moved away from the love that we are supposed to portray from God mm -hmm. that be whatever mm -hmm. side it is that um, you are, yeah you are right mm -hmm. and you so, are a man of peace and I beg you to remain all your life a man of peace and love because I mentioned it very quickly, I think that the worst sickness of the Orthodox Church today is nationalism, you know? It's killing, it's killing our Orthodox churches, patriarchates and people. Even very, very spiritual people, I know, have become very nationalist. And uh, I, uh, I don't see, you know, it has nothing to do with the gospel. So I think we have, as Orthodox, we have to be, really faithful and remain faithful to, to, to the gospel and to what Christ says to each of us in the gospel and which is very far from nationalism. And as I said, yes, there must be love. There must be, you know, there must be goodwill for this dialogue to continue and to grow because if we want to criticize the other side, we can do it forever, as I said, for decades and for centuries. Is it what we want as disciples of Christ? 